Okay. I think they disappeared. Well, mm. there's one. There's Brenda. It's okay. Let me bring her in. Hi, Brandeis. Welcome. Hello. Okay. And I need um, screen share access. Okay, you should have it now. Okay. Yes, I can. I'm going to share just that point. Okay, she said, I'm not sure what is happening. I'm going to try again. Okay. Okay. Genesis is coming in. Oh, never mind. She's uh, she's going to remain as an attendee. All right, Rocky, I'm going to start letting the attendees in. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Ah, we have Jane and Genesis as attendees. Hello. So we usually give a courtesy of a few minutes just um, at the beginning here. So once we hit the you know 705 mark, I'll definitely get started. Um, and then for those who missed the you know beginning parts, so well, they can see the recording, but I'll go ahead and get started in about th two minutes.
Okay, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining the Loyola University Chicago Black Alumni Board Black Light Speaker Series. So first of all, thank you all for joining. I said that before, but the purpose of this event is to uh, bring the community together, together and illuminate the Black Loyola University alumni through the LUC Black Alumni Board Black Light Speaker Series. Um, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Rochelle Felix Blackman, but everyone calls me Rocky. Um, I support the member relations uh, committee here for the LUC Black Alumni Board. Um, in my normal life. I am a uh, operations leader for Amazon Web Services. I also graduated from Loyola University with a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in Black World Studies. And I'm based right here in Chicago along with Loyola uh, with my husband and my son. So for today's, uh, for today's agenda, I'll be introducing our Black Alumni Board um, I will tell you a little bit more about the Black Light Speaker Series itself. And then of course, present to you our panelists for today. And at the end, we'll reserve some time for questions and answers. And I'm pretty certain that all of you will have some questions for our panelists today. So our illustrious board is right here in front of you. Um, first and foremost is our president, Karen Fleshman, um, our executive vice president, um, Omar, I mean, Flex, um, Ahmed Flex Omar, I'm so used to calling him just Flex. So um, we have Jay Yancey, who's our treasurer and our, our brains behind our scholarship that we've um, put out this year. Shakira Richards, one of our longest standing board members. She's the vice president of student relations as well as our vice president of member relations. Genesis um, Emery Foley is our newest member as the pre Vice President of Communications. Um, Dawn also helps to support on the communications and then you have myself um, supporting member relations. The Black Light Speaker Series, his name is de derived from um, the special purpose of a black light. If you think about it, the purpose of a black light is to illuminate things that are hidden. The goal of the series is to illuminate black alumni and how they've carried out Loyola's mission and principles in their communities, work and professional lives and causes. And we pick, we, we carefully curate and pick uh, alumni to come and talk to you and tell you about their experience experiences in life and they've come from all different um, you know uh, markets in this world so um, I am happy to present to you our panelists for today uh, we were supposed to have two panelists one sends their regrets and that's uh, Lanisa Renee Frederick um, if you have read the description of today's event, we are talking about life in the arts and being an actor. And in true actor form, uh, a job came through that she had to attend and had to be on set today at the same time. So unfortunately, she will not be able to join and we really hope to reschedule so you have an opportunity to talk with her. But who we do have today is our star panelist, Brandi Stanley Smith. Um, she brings a unique flair to the world of fashion and media after earning her business degree from Loyola University Chicago. Um, her impressive career began with an internship at Wilhelmina Models in New York City, and that in and of itself is impressive. Her strike in beauty and charisma quickly led to national modeling campaigns and roles in notable TV shows and films, including The Perfect Stranger and Inside Man. Brandeis' career has since evolved into on-camera hosting and fashion journalism, which features major platforms like The View, The Today Show, and Essence Magazine. As a fashion style writer for um, Newsday Westchester and a DIY content creator for Mood Fabrics and eHow, she continues to influence the fashion world with her thrifty finds and, and advice. So for me, um, I know Brandeis personally, and I was just remarking to her the fact that she's on television and on Hallmark movies. I'm like, I'm, I'm like fangirling all the time. So I'm gonna dive right into the questions because I'm dying to hear the answers to the questions that I have for you today. And hopefully I don't catch you off guard with anything. Okay. But first and foremost, what intrigues me the most about you is of all the things you could have done and going to an institution like Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago, tell us how you got into the arts and acting. Okay, it was something that I was always interested in. Even as a kid, my mom would do these little impromptu photo shoots in the living room with me or her and my dad would take me over to Chicago because I'm from Northwest Indiana. 
uh, to interview with modeling agencies. Um, my grandfather was also a minister, so I got a chance to be a part of the Sunday service every Sunday. And so I played drums, I took piano lessons starting at seven. So sometimes I would play the piano in church. My uncle was much better at it than I was. <laughs> uh, but school plays, different productions, but it's something I've always been interested in. Uh, but I didn't know that you could make a living uh, in the arts, it, being an actor. If you weren't Denzel or Charlize Theron or somebody, I thought that you were just, you know, the struck to a life of poverty. <laughs> and so I quickly learned that that was not the case, but I did seek a business degree from Loyola because I just didn't know it was possible to do it any other way. Well, that is amazing to hear. Um, and I'm and I'm glad that, you know, you found that way. And I, you know, um, that's some that's those are conversations that the board and I also have with the uh, uh, with the Loyola to talk about all the creative ways you can leverage your degree and, you know, get into the spaces that you love. So I'm glad to see that you were able to do that and pivot into something that you love. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, so I gave a quick bio, right? This was something, you know, that I came up with to, to, to hopefully honor what you do, um, but I'm sure I didn't capture everything. So what are some of the, your more recent initiatives and projects that we should know about? Uh, more recently, I have been on FBI Most Wanted, uh, a CBS show. I've also, during the pandemic, I kind of, like everybody, had to get creative. So I started doing more voice work. And so now I voice projects from my son's closet in his room um, that are that air on BET. So I'm able to do those from home. And I've created a platform called Course Creator, which helps experts and entrepreneurs in their areas of expertise and find their passion and turn it into an online course from stuff that they already know. That's amazing. Um, all right. So can you describe um, your experience as a Black woman trying to grow your career in this space? Yeah. Um, as a Black woman, just in, in a woman in general, you have to just kind of learn to, to be creative and, and find your way. And Sometimes the opportunities aren't as plentiful as we'd like. I think we've come a long way since I've started doing this many years ago, but uh, an example of that is I was a stand-in for Halle Berry on a project uh, a, a while back, and I got to be her stand-in for Revlon commercials and then the movie Perfect Stranger, which I did with Giovanna Ribisi and Bruce Willis, and that was just a learning experience in and all of itself but being a stand-in I was on set and being there every day for a few months you start to kind of just get treated like the crew after a while and so uh, one day I heard the AD asking like um, he was kind of putting in an order for extras for the next day and he said that he wanted um, 12 extras girls he's like oh I need you know, two blondes two brunettes two redheads and then the rest uh, just just mix it up and in that moment, for me, it was like, wow, we can see the differences in, in blondes and the nuances that people have, or that, you know, no two brunettes might be alike or redheads, but the rest of the demographics kind of get jumbled up in that other six people. And so I just had to learn to kind of stand out and be resourceful and creative and be know a little bit about a lot of stuff. So you don't want to be pigeonholed and 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 not be able to offer something on the spot. They say you oftentimes give your best audition on the elevator on the way going down. And mm -hmm. so that after the fact, when it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so you have to learn to think quick on your feet. What are your assets? What do you bring to it uniquely as a, a person of color? What rooms have you been in or are you allowed to adapt and code switch and be the, the corporate industrial industrials are like little videos that get shown mm. inside corporations. So yeah. I can, you know, be that person and put on my suit and be, you know, articulate or I can be laid back sister girl and and have a different type of role. And so just learning to pivot and and just embrace the whole process and be good at more than one thing because you're mm -hmm. going to need it. Um, I had a job uh, for motion capture. It's uh, where you put the suit on with all the, the balls on it Ooh, yeah. and then you make animations from it. And mm -hmm. um I went in for actually a voiceover audition and I saw a girl come out of the room and she sat down on the couch next to me in the lobby. And of mm -hmm. course, this suit looks really cool when you, you see mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So when she went back in the room, I asked the receptionist, 
who I later found out was not the regular receptionist. She was just someone filling in, answering the phone for the person. Her job was mm-hmm. in the back. But I asked her, I was like, hey, how do you do what she does? Mm -hmm. And so uh, she said, oh, you know, they're always looking for people. I can put your name on the list. And this was like on a Friday. And by Wednesday, they gave me a call to come in and do that. And so I came in and 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 that job, you have to learn to kind of you can be asked to do a dance choreography like your Rihanna in a concert. You can be a sniper on a roof. You could be faking dead. You can be diving for a pass in a, you know, in a football game, whatever it is. And so I got in that job and just tried to soak it all up, do all the things I could to to be an asset to the company. Because as a black woman, I want to be a person that you're like, man, we don't know how we did with our brand eyes before mm-hmm. she got here. But mm-hmm. it, it's going to be a big loss if she ever leaves here. Mm-hmm. And so I wound up working for that company for eight years and wow. I never saw that young lady again, but it was my everyday job Monday through Friday for like wow. four or five hours that I got to go in and do these animations. And so oh, that's pretty cool. I always tell people just get in there and, and be resourceful and make it so that you're irreplaceable. Yeah, I think that's interesting that you mentioned, you know, uh, finding ways to stand out. Um and would you say just like you said, let's striking that conversation with somebody that's a way or like what are some of the ways that you found that made you stand out and they remembered to call Brandeis back? Absolutely. Uh, striking up conversations. I, if I'm going to meet someone, oftentimes I'll do a quick few minute Google search just to see, hey, maybe you went to school in Indiana. I'm from Indiana, mm-hmm. I'm from Brooklyn, mm-hmm. New York now with my family, but maybe you, you know, we have something in common. Maybe you too like to stitch leather bags like I do, but finding commonalities with people. I also often tell people a secret weapon of mine is to remember people's birthdays and I mm. use a birthday alarm and I put it in my calendar. And so everybody thinks that like, oh, Brandeis, you always remember my birthday, girl. You just put me to shame because you always remember. But I tell people that it's good to reach out to people on their birthday because it's a day that's not important to me. It's a day that's important to you. I'm reaching out to you. I'm not asking you for anything, but I'm just letting you know that, you know, if we don't talk to each other in the next 364 days, I'll talk to you at least once a year and we can still keep the connection going. Mm -hmm. And so just little nuggets like that and Mm -hmm. always being prepared uh, when called upon uh, and acting in particular, I'd say having a good memory is important. Mm -hmm. One day I had like 19 pages of sides for three different auditions and they were all gonna be in the same room and but they were for different shows and so you know I just kind of plastered them all up on my closet door and just kind of like okay got that one remember I remember okay next one and and so you just kind of sometimes you got to fake it till you make it okay I've got a corporate jacket on for this one all right I'm going to take the jacket off show a little shoulder we can do a next kind of roll what we got and so just learning to think quickly on your feet Uh, Also, I didn't say that when I left Loyola, I happened to find the internship for Wilhelmina Models uh, online and a woman who worked in the career services office, Renilla Norris, I know she's not there anymore, but I went into her office because I was president at the time of the Dean's Advisory Council and I told her, I'm like, oh man, I saw this listing and it's it's a few months expired already, but it would have been really cool to have gotten this internship that I see that Wilhelmina Models, one of the biggest modeling agencies of the world, in the world at the time, had listed. And while I'm talking, she like takes the piece of paper and she picks up the phone and she starts dialing while we're talking. And I'm like, why is she dialing while we're talking? I'm like, who are you calling? And she's like, I'm calling Wilhelmina. And so she put me on the phone with the woman and I told him that I would be in the neighborhood. Well, I was on Loyola's campus at the time, which Mm -hmm. is a 12 hour drive away. But I said I would be in town for my spring break in the neighborhood, which I would if you gave me an opportunity. And she said that I could definitely come in for an interview. And so I was doing my first independent film at the time, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of moonlighting between classes. And I asked my husband in the film, had he ever been to um, New York? And he said, no. And I'm like, you want to go? So we literally drove 12 hours. I went up, had my interview, came back down. They gave me the job and we drove back to Loyola that wow. same day. So a 24 hour drive in a day just for the opportunity. But they gave me the internship. I turned, was able to turn that into a modeling and acting career because they started sending me out on auditions and castings in between working and I'd have to just make up the hours. 
Uh, but while I was sitting in the department doing the work every day, it was, you know, some downtime. They didn't always need me to do anything. My boss would go on these business trips and I'd be left in this little department by myself. And instead of just sitting there and just being on the phone and, and not doing nothing or just, you know, mindlessly, mindlessly doing other stuff, I would clean up the desks. I would go in the storage closet that it looked like people just opened the door, threw stuff in and shut it. And I would clean that out and organize things, put presentations together. And so word started to get around that even the president of, of Wilhelmina wanted me to come work in his department. So just making a name for yourself and, and be the person that you are and have a good work ethic, work ethic, whether someone is watching you or you think they're watching you or not, is another thing that I would recommend. That's amazing. I like that. That's really good sound advice too. Um, what are some of the things that you've had to sacrifice or do to support your dream? Hmm, good question. Um, time uh, with family and friends mm -hmm. and learning 19 pages of sides and nights like those, uh, they, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and, and people understanding in your life, not as many vacations because for a while you are trying to figure it out and, and work multiple jobs or night jobs just so you can have your daytime available. I did choose to have a child later on, you know, in life, uh, whereas in some of my peers had them early on. Uh, so those are, you know, all things that you, know, you just have to be like, okay, I got a plan. I'm working my plan and it may not look like anyone else's, but I got to keep on the blinders and just keep my head down and go after the goal that I set out for myself. And, you know, sometimes you got to work two or three jobs to get something done or different side hustles. I would work mm -hmm. at the modeling agency, you know, from nine to five and then Banana Republic and Rockefeller Center would say that I could come to work at six o'clock. They didn't do this for anybody else, but they would do it for me and let me work from six till close. And sometimes, you know, that's 12, one o'clock and I can work on the weekends and then you go home, get a few hours rest and wake up and do it all over again. And mm. you just got to tell yourself, it doesn't last forever. Yeah, if you have a plan and you're smart with your money and you're not just tiring yourself out working these multiple jobs just so you can blow the money on nonsense. But if you're mm -hmm. actually using it to pour back into yourself and doing these meet and greets and meeting casting directors or you're taking acting classes or enrolling yourself in a conservatory, I think mm -hmm. as long as you have a plan, it makes it all worth it. Agreed. I've always been told that uh, bad times or hard times don't last forever, but nor do the easy and the fun times. So you always got to be on your toes to make sure you extend or uh, work on keeping the easy times going on. So yeah. it sounds like that's what you did. <laughs> and you kind of um, spread the money out. <laughs> yeah. So this one is, I don't know if this is a harder question, but, um, and you know, think think about it, but how, how did the 2020 civil unrest and the pandemic impact your career? And what did you learn from it? <laughs> You know, I'm blessed to be able to say that the civil unrest and the pandemic, like they really didn't affect me as much because I still was able to have the motion capture job and I took the train for a little while. I would walk. It was like a nine mile round trip walk and I just call mm -hmm. it my exercise for the day. Mm -hmm. But I worked through the whole pandemic yeah. and then I had my baby right at the end. And so... Like it, I don't think it affected me the same way it affected mm -hmm. some other people. I didn't have the, you know, I'm sitting at home, I'm bored. I don't know what to mm -hmm. do with myself kind of thing. Cause yeah. I'm still out working. And I think it, it, it kind of echoes back to what I was saying earlier because my job valued me and because I had made myself an asset there, we got it from that. This is normally a two person job with someone running it. They just needed one talent, me, because I could do multiple things. If you needed me to mm -hmm. walk like a guy or, you know, switch it up and, and do something more feminine, whatever it was, I could pull it off easy enough that I could be the sole talent for the motion capture part and then the guy captured my motion. So it didn't affect me as much. And then I got mm -hmm. to start doing more of the voiceovers from mm -hmm. home. Uh, and then they started ramping up on the voiceover auditions. And so that got it more, even more work coming in. So it, it didn't mm -hmm. quite have the same effect, but it did force me to, to come up with my own content and do my own thing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of when the course creator, the platform that I created was born. And mm -hmm. so during my 
off time, I would, you know, do beta testing and, and, and work with clients and kind of get them some success stories and, mm-hmm. and building up the website and the social media and all mm-hmm. that. So I could be ready to go when it was all done. But yeah, just trying to make the most of the, the time away because what can yeah. you do? Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard so many just sort of anecdotal stories from people in this space that said exactly what you said. It forced them to be creative and take control of their careers and build things that they owned and that they can um, generate income from, but they were the, you know, sole owners. Of. So it didn't, if somebody was having a bad day or whatever, it didn't impact whether you had a job or not or what, you know what I mean? So a lot of people took control of their careers in that sense. But then I also um, kind of saw and heard anecdotally from others that um, this actually, um, uh, I want to say, created opportunities for people of color mm-hmm. because um, so many, you know, organizations, institutions were woke, right? Mm-hmm. The pandemic and the civil unrest made them think about the fact that um, not having a lens or um, fostering and encouraging diversity actually hurt their ability to appeal to the to the public. They weren't mm-hmm. doing a good job of representing the consumers of their product, whether that be the arts, whether that be actual you know retail or anything like that. So they n- noticed that there was a gap, and that offered and opened up opportunities for people of color to do more commercials, do more voiceovers in their natural, you know, dialect and accents and stuff like that, or, you know, any anything that just kind of represented what America looks like a little bit more. And I was wondering if you did talk a little bit about the fact that you were able to create something that you own, but did you find that more opportunities opened up for you as a result of the pandemic or anything, or is it kind of the same? I think, like you said, it did open up some some more opportunities. Mm-hmm. Like people are looking more for your uh, less commercial, more conversational mm-hmm. voices, and they want mm-hmm. your own rich tone. And you start to see they're looking for sound likes that sound like other urban artists that are out there. So I, I, I did see an influx in, in that sort of thing as well. Mm-hmm. And then some shows are more shows are are being created, uh, it kind of in the same vein. And so. Mm-hmm always good to to see more stuff being out there and created for us yeah and and so how do you make how does how does that make you feel do you feel like that's good for the industry or do you feel like it's performative and what is has a shelf life I don't know it's (laughs) kind of like with I mean on one hand I'm like hey let's take it while let's get by the getting is good and take it for all it's worth. And maybe by this point, you can then be at a different point in your career that you can take advantage of something else when it goes. Yeah. But then you see like with them abolishing the affirmative action that it's like, man, that, that was why, why it lasted. It was cool, but man, that went away. And so it may, may be temporarily uh, when it's no longer a fad or the thing to do. It's, it seems that uh, it sometimes uh, opportunities get taken away Mm-hmm. Um, I say strike while the iron is hot. Yeah. Create your own stuff. Uh, yeah. When I was teaching hosting classes, I taught a student who just went on. I would always say in my class, create your own content, do your own shows. We have these powerful cameras and editing software on our phones in our pockets. And so why not get out there? And so I created a, a show of my own, a magazine style show, and won a couple of awards for it. But I just had a student who won three Emmys. Um, wow. And so I'm, I, I joked with him. I'm like, man, you really took that advice to heart. That was awesome. That's and so awesome. this show is doing really well on PBS. So it's really cool to see that people are out there just taking matters into their own hands Love it. And, and showing their own voices. Love it. So what would be your advice? You started on, down this path already, but what would be your advice to someone seeking a career in acting? Hmm. I say, definitely, like I just said, it, create mm-hmm. your own content. Don't be afraid to do that. Uh, even if you if you don't know how to write a script, take a course on it. Don't be afraid mm-hmm. to take courses and classes, even if they're online. Take one with a friend. Barter with a friend. I mm-hmm. got more into voiceovers because a friend and I, rest in peace to her, her and I sat down for six weeks and for and we'd take two hours and I'd book a room in this building I was living in and for an hour she'd teach me voiceovers because I just couldn't get past a slump uh, at a certain point and then I'd teach her on camera hosting and so even if you and a friend barter time with each other to learn mm-hmm. something never be afraid to to stop learning and creating your own stuff 
Mm-hmm. I also say to have a thick skin. Mm. This business, you you exponentially get more no's, but a lot of times you don't get anything at all. And so sometimes I personally wonder if that's worse than the, the no that you would have gotten. Mm-hmm. You don't mm-hmm. hear anything. It's like, oh man, it was a week ago that I put that on tape and I spent four hours learning the lines and putting it on tape. Just never, they say on tape, but recording it, uh, never to hear anything again from it. So mm-hmm. that I think it is pretty tough. And then your friends and family, bless their hearts. They ask you about it. Like, well, how was that audition? And I just get to the point that I have to do them and forget them because I'm mm-hmm. like, what audition? Oh, that, okay. Oh, I, I forgot about it. <laughs> it'll drive you crazy. Yeah. Be like, oh man, I should hit up my agent and make sure she got it. Or did mm-hmm. she like it? Or, you know, did she, can she call the office and, and get any feedback for me? And so that, that kind of stuff can make you crazy. So just early on, I just yeah. had to um, like kind of distance myself from it. Once I hit send on it and sent it off, like it was mm-hmm. no longer my responsibility and out of my hands. And mm. So sometimes you have to protect your peace also is another piece of advice because I'll have people tell me like, oh, so-and-so got your role. Well, I believe God knew that that person was going to get that role, my own mm-hmm. personal belief. And like, if it must wasn't my role if that person got it. So mm-hmm. you know, just we don't even have to continue to have that conversation because that right. was that person's blessing. That one wasn't mine. On to the next. Exactly. And so do what works for you and keeps you happy because life is short and it's a lot going on and a lot of people are going through a lot of stuff. So just have a thick skin and be resilient in this career. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd also, like I said, be good at several things. If you're interested in cooking, take a cooking class. If you're like, you know what, I've always wanted to learn how to frost the perfect cupcake. Let me take a course on that, even if it's online. Uh, Right now, shoot, I'm taking pilot lessons for I'm in ground school for pilot lessons and Mm -hmm. so like just whatever interests you Mm -hmm. I said to go after because you never know when you're going to be called upon to to do that thing or Mm -hmm. need that piece of information or can be an asset to someone in a in a different way or can make money from it um my husband when we were dating kind of asked me like he was the first person to ask me like hey like you ever thought about doing classes I had all this information in my head about modeling and acting but it kind of just never dawned on me to get 20 people in a room to pay a little fee, book the room, have stuff to show them, handouts, exercises that they can do. And then mm-hmm. that blossomed into a, a course that I created that I made over $20,000 doing that course. And so mm-hmm. I just say, just know a little about a lot and don't mm-hmm. be afraid to put yourself out there and don't be afraid to package your knowledge and, and hang your shingle. You just need mm-hmm. to know more than the people taking your class and you can right. learn on the fly, ask yeah. them what they want to know more about such and such topic before you teach it next week. So mm-hmm. I say, just put yourself out there. Love that. That is really great sound advice. Um, perfect. So um, I have an idea of how you might answer this because you have mentioned a little bit of it before, but if you don't say it, I'm going to pepper your answer with the, with those seeds. But um, okay. how has your experience at Loyola prepared you for um, your industry? Loyola taught me to be, I had to get resourceful at Loyola. Uh, I came from a small town in, like I said, Northwest Indiana called Michigan City. And I was a bigger fish in this small pond. And so when I came to Loyola, it was like the kick in the teeth to get there. And my best was just not good enough in my classes. And I just was discombobulated at first. And so I had to get resourceful and find tutors and create study groups and sit in the front row of my classes and make sure my professors knew my name and go to their office hours and talk to them about the questions I had uh, if I didn't understand because I did an accounting degree and I minored in Spanish. And so like I just had to kind of rise to the occasion and do stuff differently than I had been doing it. My, uh, I remember one time I had a presentation and I literally worked the whole night on it and my roommate went to sleep. I was out in the hallway working on this big gigantic banner I was creating and, and getting stuff together and making sure I had my talking points. And I walked back into our room 
um, during uh, the morning after the sun had risen and she woke up and she looked at me and she looked at my clothes and she was like, you never went to bed? And I'm like, no, I didn't. Um, and so I just had to learn to when the library closed, all right, we're going to take this party, pack it up and, and go study somewhere else where I can get a table and some quiet. And so Loyola just taught me to work harder than I thought I ever had to, to seek help, uh, even if I thought I had it, um, and just to, to be tenacious. Uh, it also taught me to be a leader. During I remember during elementary school, uh, one time I came home and I told my mom that I had um, uh, petitioned to be the treasurer for like the student council. And my mom was like, president wasn't available and like it just never dawned on me to be president I thought I was doing something being treasurer which is a good mm -hmm. position yeah but once I got to Loyola I was like you know what I, I, I became a Kemper scholar it was an internship gr grant program that the I think the university used to offer I don't think it's mm -hmm. there anymore. uh but I just had to uh I went out for a president of the Dean's Advisory Council later on and saw like, hey, you know, I'm gonna be at this meeting anyway. It's just a little bit extra work, not much, but I can carry this. And so mm -hmm. it made me rise to the occasion to see that I was capable of more than I was giving myself credit for. That's awesome. You you mentioned a couple of skills that you were able to leverage um, you know, to get find success as an actress. And two things. You said one. You, you came to the realization that there were bra uh, blondes, brunettes, redheads, and they were differentiated, but then everything else was lumped together mm -hmm. and um, you had to find a way to stand out. But I would imagine that you experienced going to a PWI, that was the reality of being at that type of an institution. You found your way, to, and you just said it actually with your professors, finding a way to stand out and seek out the help and talk to them so they knew who you were and that there was effort being put forward. Um, you found a way to do that at Loyola, and I would imagine that you took the seeds of those skills and brought Absolutely. them to your professional life. Absolutely. And the other thing that you mentioned that I think that um, is a skill that a lot of people maybe don't um, elevate as a skill or we don't rotate enough or lean in on this, but um, code switching, you use that phrase, right? Yeah. <laughs> and code switching isn't necessarily a black, white, you know, thing, but it's being adaptable in different environments so that um, you ever, um, there's skills about how do you make people like you, right? And they say mirror that person. So if they brush their hair a lot, you brush your hair a lot, you know what I mean? Like, so you mirror a person and that's a lot of, a lot to do with code switching to adapt and fit into the environments that you're in. And, uh, you know, an institution like a Loyola, I think that's a, you had to do that quite a bit, depending on what, there's all these different variations of, uh, you know, ethnicities or, um, you know, affinity groups and things like that. And um, finding a way to fit in and find find people who align with you and things like that, that was very important for success there because how do you um, find people who like you enough to want to barter with you, to study with you, to do these things with you? And I think I feel like some of those seeds of those skills that you mentioned that carried you forward in your career um, started at Loyola. And I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but you could tell me if that's true or not. <laughs> it is true. It, it, it is very much true. Uh, you, you do have to kind of learn like what works for you. Um, being extra bubbly for, for me, uh, it works for me and it makes, uh, people, I don't know, it, it disarms people, uh, mm. is the word out. And sure. you know, so, so being happy or speaking in a higher register, I don't necessarily do it purposefully. It's kind of how I speak, but I am cognizant of being mm -hmm. a little bit more chipper and uplifting. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, some, People, if we're just, you know, if they're more, if they're your same ethnic group, you you might have a, a different way that you could speak to them. I think you and I were speaking to each other differently on our yeah. practice. Absolutely. And so I, I think it's reading the room, uh, knowing what works in a, in a track record that you've had. And like you said, Loyola was a, an early start for me. I think I had to do it in, in, in middle school and high school and stuff too, but yeah. it really changed for me at Loyola because I was no longer, like I said, this bigger fish in a smaller pond and the game was just played different and, and Absolutely. people rose to the occasion in a different way. And so I had to kind of quickly assess what was going on around me. Okay, so everyone else is doing this or, all right, so they're studying longer or, you know, they have these groups like, I don't have a group, but I got to find a group quickly to study with. And so 
or they stay at the library till it closes and they kick us out. And then I got to go back to Mertz Hall or wherever I'm staying and, 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 you know, find something different going on. But yeah, reading the room and being able to quickly assess things. I, I, I absolutely learned. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Yes. Reading the room. Let's call it that. Yeah. Um, that is definitely a skill. So, um, and, and I guess in closing here, um, you mentioned a lot of different things about how Loyola has helped you, resources that may or may not be available, different things. But this question here is, um, you know, your opportunity, your platform, and uh, an opportunity to reach back to help others coming up. How would you challenge the staff, professors, mentors, et cetera, to support students and young adults who are exploring careers in this space, or maybe to support them in general, but definitely in this space, because I don't know um, how much there is for people who want to go into the arts. I say with the arts to be a support, I think with anybody, uh, I say that it costs us nothing to like a post or share a post if it's something that we're, we're interested in or we were supportive of the person's work. I've oftentimes bought tickets to a friend's show, even if they were in a different city and said, hey, mm -hmm. I'm not in your city and can't be at the show, but you know, uh, sponsor someone else on me or use it as a ticket that you can raffle off uh, to someone else so they can see the show. But I just want to be able to support you. Uh, if they have something that's streaming, put it on in the background, even if you're you're busy. But be able to uh, help in ways that don't necessarily, I mean, other than the ticket, by the ticket I just said, that don't cost you anything but a few seconds. And, you know, send them a, a meme or information like, hey, I saw this Instagram hack that might work for you. Like I have a friend who has a beauty brand and I saw this countdown timer that was really cute. And I was like, I don't know if you ever tried something like this, but I thought it was cute. And she's like, I love it. And she implemented it in her business. So if you see something that someone in the arts can use, or it's just a word of encouragement, because this career can be brutal at times, uh, just send them a pick me up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just be supportive in the little ways and, and, and show up for them, watch what they're in, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I think it can go a long way. Mm -hmm. And if you could turn that question around to specifically, you know, people at Loyola who have, you know, some influence like the staff or professors or people who are champions for students, what are some things that they could do to help people who are in, you know, currently students coming up, just graduated, what are some things that they could do to help encourage or support people trying to get into the arts? Mm -hmm. I say to, if they can be a champion for different outlets, like I, like I said, I mentioned, I was a part of the Kemper Scholar Program. If opportunities though, like those don't currently exist, if they can put it in the ear of the person who has the say, the dean of the school, to, to possibly implement such things, if they can can show up, like I said, to, to shows or if they're doing them nearby or something that they can, can see them. Uh, if they can recommend them or be a reference that they can, hey, you can use me on this letter of recommendation or I'll be a, um, like LinkedIn has those things where you can say someone does a great job kind of. Yeah. That they, so um, I think there are small ways if you don't necessarily have a job that you can put someone in, mm -hmm. uh, referring them to other people in your network, making the, availing that to them. If that's like, hey, you know, I know you don't know them, but my neighbor does such and such and such and such. And I think you might be right for it. I'll, you know, drop your headshot and resume off or do it digitally. People are doing it more digitally nowadays, but mm -hmm. I can put in a good word for you. Um, or I can, you know, make the assignment that you have as a professor, show me your creative prowess. And, and instead of doing it this way, well, I want to see what you can do with this assignment and, and see how you can creatively execute what I've asked be done in the assignment and just kind of reaching them where they already are. Mm -hmm. I like that. And those are all very easy ways, um, like, you know, low level of effort um, type of ways. And um, uh, leveraging the knowledge or like you said, the, the resources that you already have. It's not like you're building anything new for, so those are pretty easy things that people can do to help somebody coming up in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like that advice. So I think um, that brings us to the end of the questions that I had prepared for, pre prepared for you. So thank you for being gracious enough going through my questions. Yeah. Um, um, hopefully I didn't catch you off guard with too much of anything there. <laughs> um, but I would like to turn it over uh, to the audience to see if there are any questions there. I do see something here in, um, oh, 
I do have a, a message and I don't know if you know Jane Newfeld. She's part of the Loyola oh, organization. She says, I don't have a question, but I would like to say I am so proud of you. And it's in all caps. And oh. I will tell people I know her, Rambler Proud. Love you. Love that. Thank you for saying that, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Yep. Um, so does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? You can type it in the chatter in the Q and A. While we wait for those, Rocky, what type of outlets are there available now for students of color on, on campus? In the well, arts in our art specifically, that's that's a space that I don't necessarily work in, but um, there are tons of resources for alums where um, I, I don't think that they are um, rarely published or known about where um, there are benefits to being a student. You can come back on campus and do several things that are, um, you know, at no cost to you. Um, even at the downtown campus, there are resources that you know, people can leverage. You can always go back to the Career Center, of course. We talked, you talked about leveraging that. Um, when I graduated, years after I graduated, I was trying to think about how I pivot my career um, and leverage the Career Center. I actually remember, and this is a short anecdotal story before we, if we don't get any questions, I went back to, um, and this is probably a sad commentary, but I went back to the career center and um, I asked, and I was applying like crazy for different jobs. And I asked the person in the career center, um, I have that my minor on here is black world studies. Do you think that's impacting? Cause they will probably assume that I'm black. Do you think that's impacting the reason why, you know, I'm not getting jobs. Do you think they're judging me and, you know, because I'm black, not, you know, considering me. And the person said, maybe, but would you want to work for a place that would judge you because you are black or because you support black organizations? And I was like, hmm, good point. <laughs> he said, so leave it on there. You're doing yourself a favor if you're weeding out an organization that uh, so, you know yeah. would judge you that way. Um, I went back and told my husband the comment that he said, he said, but uh, that don't pay your bills. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we support. need to strategically think about what is impacting you from getting a job. So um, yeah, and so those, you know, again, I was well out of, you know, being out of Loyola. So those resources are always available. And um, through the Black Alumni Board, um, and that's why we encourage people to stay in contact and, um, you know, talk to us all the time. Uh, we have connections to people all around the organization, if, if someone, for example, were interested in, in acting and wanted to understand how they could talk to someone as a mentor in that, in that department, like Karen, for example, um, you know, reach directly out to the dean of that department to understand, like, how do we get more students uh, exposed to this event, for example, and, or if, if there were an opportunity that they were looking for, you know, um, we could gladly connect to the people that we have um, relationships with or develop a relationship on behalf of our alums to be able to connect them and get them what they need. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to encourage people to get involved and just understand what's available to them and the fact that we are here um, to help advocate for Black alums. Wow, that's, that's mm -hmm. very uh, Did we have any additional questions here before we wrap up? Because I do have um, my own uh, things that we have to cover here. At the end, if there are no questions, I can move on. Okay, Rocky. Can uh, can hey. we speak instead of writing yeah. long? Just yeah, go a bit for of it. Here. Go, Paul. Okay, very nice. Uh, just a question, Warren, on the industry side. Uh, how do you find it now in, in L.A. and Hollywood for jobs, seeing that everything is moving all over the country from back in the Chicago, Atlanta, Toronto, that people are filming, doing things or whatever, where the tax incentives are the best? You still feel the industry is strong out there, or you know, how do you feel? And you ever have any inclination of coming back to Chicago? I I think I think California and Hollywood will always have its place and and be a big mecca for film and television. Obviously, as the years have gone on, we now see Atlanta. Uh, New York has always been there. I personally live in New York, but. I think you just kind of have to learn to to be what they call a local hire, where you kind of go and put yourself in that location. 
a lot more people nowadays are putting themselves on tape and they're actually being watched. For example, uh, several years ago, I kind of got booked off something directly off my audition tape. And I was like, oh, wow, it's good to see that, you know, mm -hmm. the tapes are being watched now. And a casting director friend of mine uh, kind of chimed in and was like, yeah, because they didn't used to be. And you're like, oh, man. So all, all the time we were spending making those audition tapes for a while, they weren't even being watched or cared about because you had people coming into the room. But now, especially since the pandemic, even casting directors are working from home and, and, and moving to the southeast and, and other locations. And so... Mm -hmm. I think it's starting to change. I think California will always have its place, but I think the Southeast is definitely developing and, and having its place for people. Yeah. Um, I don't, I do get back to Chicago. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I have a rental property back in my hometown. And so I fly into Chicago. And so when I'm there, I like the time before last, I kind of hit Jane up and said, I'm not sure if you're on campus, but my husband and I are walking around and I want to see it. And so it had been years since I had been there, but I did see it. And it, it, it's, it's even more beautiful than it was when I lived there. And so many more things are offered to students, which is, is just awesome. Well, good. Well, I'm the, I'm going to put this out there. If you ever come back to Chicago, you know, Jane knows how to get me. I'm involved in the industry. I, I oh. make movies. I don't know if you heard of Cinespace and uh, Cinecity. We created all of that out there and we do all sorts of things from Disney to whatnot. So I'm one of the film guys. In fact, I did things out in LA for a long time with Paramount and things. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the, I'm the old dean of the graduate school of business. So I'm just kind of in here listening because these guys are doing a phenomenal job on stuff. So appreciate you coming back and doing what you're, what you're doing there and things like that. So, uh, you know, keep it, keep it up, but the invitation is open. When, if you ever come back, you know, come back for the, you know, Midwest film awards or something, uh, you know, when we do those. Cool. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate it. Paul, I'm so glad you said something because otherwise I was going to out you and, and let her know. You're going to out me? Well, you know, we got a very, you know, we're building the industry here. We're really mm -hmm. strong. We were out in L.A. Uh, with the governor, uh, you know, trying to promote all the studios back here. And everybody's, and, and you know, creating stuff here like we're trying to do. And, you know, it's going to be a new hub of things since uh, the governor's on the on his uh, wagon to make us a huge industry here, you know, take it all the way from LA. So we're going to, we'll see what we can do. We're going to compete with you, but Hey, just another quick question since I'm on it and yeah. you do a lot of voice, a lot of voiceovers, how much do you think AI is going to affect the whole voiceover area? That's tough. We had a whole strike about that. Um, I, I think it's going to creep in um, more than we'd like but hopefully they'll start doing more and more legislation to kind of keep it at bay because it's a shame to to be able to take just you know a small snippet of someone's voice and be able to recreate this whole thing out of it and you never need their services again and so as an artist our persona and who we are is how we make our money and so i i hope they still allow artists to to be able to do that and create their art and not manufacture it all right. Well, well, thank you very much for the answers there. I, I can keep going, but I'll let anybody else take over now. But again, thank you for all you're doing and supporting everybody. Thank you. Those were amazing questions. Thank, thank you, Paul. And um, Karen Flashman is the president of the um, uh, board, and she wanted to send her apology. She's having technical issues and can't uh, speak, but I, I know she wanted to uh, share, you know, her thank you for you joining as well and, and um, presenting with us today. Thank you. All right. So um, I am, I don't think we have additional questions. So I am going to do my housekeeping items here, Brandeis. Um, as I mentioned early on in, in, in the presentation, uh, one of our board members, the treasurer, Jay Yancey, has championed creating uh, the first of its kind uh, Black Alumni Board, Mamie Till Mobley Scholarship. And we always ask um, our attendees and, and those who are listening to the recording to consider giving a donation to help support this scholarship. Um, this uh, supports underprivileged students who are looking for additional support to be able to come to an institution like Loyola 
the University of Chicago. And as you can see, you know, through the alums that we highlight through the Black Alumni, um, I mean, Black Alumni series, uh, Loyola has a lot to offer students, you know, students who are coming from diverse backgrounds, and, uh, and they can find success in these different markets that we're highlighting all the time. So um, for those that are listening and who are, um, who can consider um, donating to our scholarship, and the link is right here um, on the screen, and you can, you can search it by looking up Mamie Till Mobley scholarship on the internet as well. The last thing, and um, Brandeis, you did a really good job of helping me to segue to this. Um, you asked, you know, where what resources are available to people who have graduated from Loyola. And one of the things that we encourage is that people do get involved. And we have here, if you're interested in more information about the alumni board or resources that we can help point you to, um, we do, you can contact us at Loyola Black Alumni Board at gmail.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Facebook by searching Loyola University Black alumni. Um, so we are welcome and encouraged that you want to get involved yourself and spread the word to help us grow and help, you know, uh, upcoming students as well as alums who are trying to find their way or want to give back. This is the best way to do it. All right, that brings us to the end of today's Black Light uh, series. And I wanna thank you again, Brandeis, for joining us. This was amazing and you look amazing and so like Hollywood-esque over there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. At uh, nine o'clock at night, your time. So we really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who attended and joined us tonight. We appreciate your commitment and dedication. And uh, hopefully you learned something today. Have a great evening. Bye, thank everyone. Bye-bye.